And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. One of my favorite games is Memoir 44 and Commands and Colors Ancients. I also like Battle Lore, um, the Battle Cry, that series of games, basically the Commands and Colors series from Richard Borg. And now we have the newest entry to this series, and that is Commands and Colors Napoleonics. Now, it looks very similar to GMT's other version of the game, Commands and Colors Ancients, but there is a very dramatic difference in how this game plays. In fact, when you look at this game and you play how the, this game, it almost feels like you're watching an evolution of a game take place from the Command of Colors Ancients, and as we go throughout history, here we're in the Napoleonic era until we get to the Memoir 44 era, uh, World War II, and it's different. Uh, I'm not saying that the Memoir is the best of the series or that it's the most evolved, but you can see the game kind of transitioning because in Commands and Colors Ancients, it was all about hand-to-hand -hand combat. In Memoir 44, it's all about taking cover and shooting. In this one, it's kind of in the mix, but this one adds some things that aren't in other games, some things that people think should be in other games, I've heard, and the, there are several neat ideas in here that I like, and it looks really good. In short, it's great, but let's take a look at it first. Alright, if you've never played a Commands and Colors battle before, you, you, well, if you have, you'll recognize this board because it's very similar. But if you, if you've not, you might not notice. And I'll, I'll zoom up a little bit. The board is split into three parts, separated by that dotted line that I just showed you. And you're going to build a battlefield on it using terrain. There's a whole pile of terrain hexes that come with the game. And then you look in a scenario book, and that scenario book will show you how much terrain to use. Now, unlike the first part in the GMT series, the Commands of Colors Ancients, there is very little terrain. In this game, there's actually quite a bit more. And so you'll set the terrain on the board, however the game tells you to set it up. And that's a pretty terrible <laughs> setup there. But once you're done setting up the terrain, you're then going to put your armies on the board. Now the armies are made up of little blocks, and you have to sticker these blocks on both sides, which will take a great amount of time. If you look over here, you can see how many of those uh, blocks that I've stickered. But Eventually, you'll do that, and then you're going to build units with these blocks. So, each unit will have a different amount of blocks. It's usually three, four, or five units that are in, a, in an area. And you'll set those up on the board. Once each side is set up, then players are going to be drawing cards from this shared command deck. And you'll be drawing cards equal to the command of your commander. Uh, some, the smarter the commander is, the more cards you draw. And then you'll be playing a card from your side. So say this one, for example, says Probe Center, issue an order to two units or leaders in the center. What that means is I can take two units that are in the center section of the board and I can move them and then attack with them. When I attack with these units, I'm going to be rolling these dice here. You get a certain amount of dice for each unit in the game and you're trying to roll whatever you're attacking. So if I'm attacking infantry, I try to roll blue. If I'm attacking uh, artillery, if I'm attacking cavalry, uh, this is a wild for most of the figures, although not for all of them. And there's a chart because it can be confusing over who gets to attack where and with what. And so you look at the chart for your army and that chart will tell you how many dice you get for ranged because ranged in this battle is, is a decent amount and how many you get for melee, and then any extra, you know, what happens if you move, you know, if you move and fire, you get a certain amount of dice. And so you look at your army, and you look at each unit that you have and according to this chart. And then, of course, you also might have to check this terrain chart to see if there's any kind of restrictions on the dice, depending on the terrain that your units are on. Now I want to take a time to, for those of you who've played Commands and Colors, I want to talk about some of the differences in this game than other games. The leaders in this game are important and still will be counted as a victory point. And I guess I should mention, for if you've never played one of these games before, you're trying to eliminate complete units so that you can get a victory point for your side. Uh, and if you, if you do so, you get a certain amount of victory points per scenario, then you win. But leaders can be eliminated, but they're, leaders are important in this game, but they're not nearly as important, at least I feel, as they were in Commands and Colors Ancients. 
but they're still there. They can still join up with units and they give them some bonuses. Another thing I like about this game is the artillery. There is now ground, foot, and horse artillery. And the horse artillery is useful because the horse artillery can move and fire, which is something that I don't see very often in, in these style games. And so just there's more maneuverability. That's not a huge change. The huge changes are working with the cavalry themselves. The cavalry now have an option when they are attacked to retreat and reform, uh, which allows them to kind of pull back, or I'm sorry, retire and reform it's called, where they can pull back and move back towards their battle, battle side, and it keeps cavalry really light on their feet, and it makes them a lot harder just to advance and kill them. Cavalry are very powerful, especially in this game, especially when they're fighting infantry, but infantry has a new way to fight cavalry now, and that's called forming a square. There's this card here when you can use to form four squares, and when you form a square with your card, you actually have to give up one of your command cards from your hand, and then you'll use a square token and put it on that unit so you know which square that it matches in that infantry unit then. Let's say they're being attacked. They now have formed a square, which makes them much more powerful against cavalry. Cavalry will have a difficult time taking them down. In fact, there's a chance that the cavalry will bounce back uh, and not be able to fight at all. So that's one of the biggest changes of the game. Other than that, it's basically a straight up, you know, kind of a halfway between Memoir 44 and Commands and Colors, because in Commands and Colors, range combat was very minimal, wasn't very powerful at all, it was most melee. Here, melee is still powerful, but range combat is much more important, not as important as it is in Memoir 44. And also, the like I said, the different terrain types really will play a factor into this game, because there's much, uh, they, there's much more terrain on a battlefield. And so those are the basic differences, and that's a very brief overview of the game. Well, it would be crazy for me not to say that I like this game, because I do. I like all the Commands and Colors games. Where do I place this one? Well, frankly, I don't know yet because I have not played it enough. I'm still not sure I like it as much as I love those sweeping armies that I have in Commands and Colors. But it was a lot of fun. I especially enjoyed one of the things that I didn't mention uh, earlier, and that's the combined arms, where you're able to take artillery and an infantry or cavalry unit, and they can work together and smash a unit. And in this game, artillery is just nasty. you really got to be careful. Uh, and you, if you utilize your artillery effectively, it can be really well. And I love the whole combined arms uh, working together, having your army work in conjunction with another. The infantry forming the squares is a neat idea. Um, sounds, I think, neater in, in concept than it was in actual execution. I mean, we did it, and it was, you know, sometimes it's a last resort, you know, get into the square now as the cavalry comes in to destroy you, but um, it didn't actually, in, in the games that I've played, hasn't decided any battles. But still, it's very entertaining. The Napoleonic Wars are, are fun to fight. I'm glad I can use this system. It's my favorite wargaming system in existence. I'm glad I can use it for this battle, and like I said, uh, seeing range combat kind of evolve, you can kind of see this. Uh, I would actually go so far to say that I really enjoyed this version so much that this is the way I think Battlecry should be. Battlecry is the Civil War version of this. It was the first game to come out. And while it wasn't a bad game, I think this game is the culmination of what Battlecry should have been. And I would probably like to use the rules for this game with the units and scenarios from Battlecry. Well... Most of you who are looking at this, I mean, if you've never played uh, Commands and Colors before, I can tell you, try it. It's easy, it's simple, go out and get it. If you've played Commands and Colors before, well, this one is different enough from the other series that you will probably want to get it in your collection, especially so you can play these scenarios. Thanks for joining us today. For more written, audio, and video reviews, as well as the number one board game podcast, check out the website at www.thedicetower.com. Until then... This is Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.